Coming up next on Lumley Live, historian Jack Stanley is back. We're going to have a fascinating discussion about five forgotten presidents. That's next on Lumley Live. It's time for Lumley Live, where history and politics collide. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Now, here's your host, a man who can name all 45 U.S. presidents while flying an airplane and chewing gum at the same time, Jim Lumley. Stand by in three, two, one. Well, today on Lumley Live, we're happy to have back historian Jack Stanley from Chicago, and we're going to talk about five forgotten presidents. Uh, Jack, two of them are Democrats, two Whigs, and one Republican. How's that for a gang? It's a Whitman sampler, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) I have them right here. Let me introduce, we're going to talk about uh, Martin Van Buren, Zachary Taylor, uh, Miller, Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and Benjamin Harrison. Uh, First, uh, Martin Van Buren, of course, known as the uh, the great musician, he's got a pretty great resume. He's the governor of New York, a United States senator, secretary of state, vice president, uh, basically co-founder of the Democratic Party, uh, a brilliant political strategist of the time. How in the heck did he make it in the den of forgotten presidents? It, it's kind of interesting with him because he was brilliant. I mean, yes, he he totally creates that that whole uh, the. The Democratic Party, but but the whole thing with with uh, with Van Buren is the fact that he took the political machine and combined it with the political theater, and it's something brand new, something that people hadn't done before. And what I find really fascinating about him is that he made he made Andrew Jackson. I mean, Andrew Jackson used the little magician, as they called him, to uh, basically bolster him up, to, to guide him. And unfortunately, after he worked so hard with Jackson, he wins the presidency on his own with Jackson's basically support. And he has just handed every disaster you can imagine. And it's, uh, it's a big problem. First off, you have the panic of 1837, yes. totally just decimates the economy, uh, destroys so much. Um, in fact, it, it, it calls for a whole big change in government, which would take place around 1840. And he was quite a intelligent, um, he was a master politician, but he just didn't have the right time. And that kind of led to his total basically forgetting about him because he just didn't seem to matter too much. And of course he followed Jackson. And Jackson, of course, kind of is one of those individuals that sucks the air out of a room, you know? And uh, like many other individuals in the American presidency suffer the same thing when they're next to a very, very charismatic and popular president. Harry Truman after FDR, George H.W. Bush after Ronald Reagan. Yeah, or take a look at William McKinley, you know, and Theodore Roosevelt. Everybody forgets about McKinley to a degree, you know, same kind of thing. But uh, Van Buren, uh, amazing, fascinating, spoke his first language was Dutch. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing as well. Um, But uh, there was also rumors when he was president that uh, he was the illegitimate son of Aaron Burr. (laughs) <laughs> which is totally false, of course. But he basically, he, he really kind of brought politics along. You know, he, he legitimized it in many respects. And one last thing to mention. Sure. Uh, about uh, Van Buren. During his administration, Texas tried to become a state. Yes. And, but the thing was, it was such a hot potato because the North said, no, the South said, sure. (laughs) And of course there was this monstrous slave state. And so Van Buren didn't want to touch it. And of course uh, he didn't. And it wasn't until John Tyler uh, who brought it in as a state. But it's it's kind of an interesting period of time. Yet all the stuff going on and uh, 
Uh, he just, he just, he was just at the wrong time. Well, let's talk next about Zachary Taylor, old rough and ready. Uh, this is the emergence of the Whig Party, the first Whig Party uh, president elected. Mm -hmm. I've got this book here on the 20 year history of the Whig Party. Why does Zachary Taylor make that list of forgotten presidents? Well, he wasn't there too long. And he wasn't exactly someone that you would truly remember anyway. I mean, he didn't look presidential. Well, if you went to the White House when he was president, he'd be outside and you'd think he was the gardener, okay? I mean, he didn't like to dress up. He liked to wear farmer's clothes, you know, at the White House. He was kind of comfortable with that. And he was a strange looking fellow. I mean, he had these stubby legs and a kind of a long trunk and he had a hard time getting on horses, but he was, he was an interesting character. But in that respect, forgettable, excuse me. Um, because he had no political experience whatsoever. I, I think the only time he ever voted in his life was uh, when he ran for president. That's correct. Um, and the other thing that's kind of interesting about him that he didn't want to be a very proactive president. He let his cabinet do what they had to do and he would just make comments here and there. And of course, the major thing with him is the compromise of 1850 which he was totally against because of some of the tenets of the compromise. He was for allowing California, but he didn't like things favoring the South. He was a slave owner, but he was not for the expansion of slavery. A Virginian, yeah. And so he said, no. And South Carolina said, okay, we'll secede, <laughs> you know. Mm. Heck with you. And everything went up into a fever pitch and everyone said, there's going to be a civil war. And then he died. Yeah. Ate some warm <laughs> cherries. And I mean, I mean, it's the most amazing thing when you think about it. It's like the dynamites in the room. The fuse runs down from the dynamite. The fuse has been lit and everyone's waiting for the dynamite to explode and suddenly some water falls on the fuse and puts it out. I mean, he dies. I mean, it, it, it's an amazing moment in time. In fact, people thought he was assassinated. And that's why he was exhumed, exhumed in 1991. Yeah. And they found that, no, he was not assassinated. He had as much arsenic in him. They were saying perhaps it was arsenic poisoning. Um, he had as much arsenic as any other individual of the time. Right. And so uh, basically he just died at the perfect moment. Now, he was not a Democrat, Republican or a Federalist. He was a member of this new Whig Party. For those who are watching, give a 30 second a little advertisement. What was the Whig Party? Well, the Whig Party were basically a lot of old Federalists. And they were a lot of. Um, basically disenchanted Democratic Republicans who had different views from what would become the Democratic Party. It was much more a party that surrounded Henry Clay. Mm. Henry Clay was in many respects sort of like their standard bearer. And they had something called the American Plan. And this was an organization, if you think about it, with the Whigs, they wanted to do great things in the, in the country, build roads, build highways, you know, create this and that. Um, but the fact is that the Whig Party was built of so many different opposing thoughts and ideas that it just couldn't stay together. And it would basically implode, very much like the Federalists did. Same kind of thing. And by the 1850s, which is the time of uh, Taylor, that's the last time they're ever going to have a candidate. It's over. Wow. And Zachary Whig Taylor didn't dead. exactly follow the orthodoxy of the Whig Party. No, he didn't follow anybody's orthodoxy. He didn't. He followed his own. He really, I mean, he sent, he was nominated. They sent him a letter. There wasn't enough postage, so he sent it back. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he was totally disinterested. Yeah. It's, and it's really kind of a fascinating thing with him. Another interesting tidbit in history is he uh, uh, didn't want to be inaugurated on Sunday, March 4th, because it fell on a Sunday. 
any time in that period of time, whenever you went to a Sunday, you would never have an inauguration. It would always be put off. And sometimes they would have a secret uh, swearing in. Uh, but in, in Taylor's case, they just waited to the 5th. So here it is now, uh, July 4th, uh, celebration, 1850. Taylor attends a celebration in Washington, D.C., heads back to the White House, uh, asks the butler to get him a warm bowl of cherries and a warm glass of milk. He eats those, and a few days later, he comes down with a gastrointestinal disease, and he is dead shortly thereafter. Um, uh, his vice president, uh, uh, Miller Fillmore, lucky number 13, is it, is it uh, correct to say that he just wasn't prepared to be president? He was, I don't even know how to describe Miller Fillmore. <laughs> a New York uh, former school teacher. Yeah, he was a school teacher. He created the first library at the White House. He kind of spoke in little words, was kind of dull. Was, was probably one of the most unimpressive presidents. Although he was a very good looking president. People used to remark on his looks, but he was just dull. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the fact is that he had been for the uh, Fugitive Slave Act with the Compromise of 1850. Yep. And when Lincoln was assassinated, his home was attacked. Millard Fillmore's home in New York. Interesting. Was attacked and damaged by rioters. Yeah. In the Fugitive Slave Act, this is the time of Harriet Tubman, because I went and saw the movie uh, last year, and that was during her time in the Underground Railroad, and that really hurt the cause a great deal. Well, yeah. But the whole thing is, we, it, we should take with Miller the film, or we should actually say 1850, because the compromise of 1850 is ready to explode, and the dynamite's in the room. And it's ready to take off and Taylor dies and Millard Fillmore says, I'll sign it. <laughs> Let's, you know, he basically does not want a civil war on his hands. He is ill-equipped to deal with it. Also, the thing about Millard Fillmore is the fact that everybody starts dying at the time of his administration. The White House is constantly covered with mourning cloth. Wow. You know, think about all of the individuals that died between the period of 1850 to 1853. Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, the president himself, Mrs. John Quincy Adams. There's this uh, a number of others that pass away. And so they're constantly in mourning during his administration. And Daniel um, Webster is his secretary of state. Yeah, he died in 1852. Now, he did make a good Supreme Court uh, appointment, uh, Benjamin Curtis, who was the only dissenter in the Dred Scott decision. Yes. But listen to this, Jack. So here's Millard Fillmore. He's a Whig party member from, from uh, New York, from the North. But when it comes to slavery, he says this, quote, God knows that I detest slavery, but it is an existing evil that we must endure. Give it such protection as it guaranteed by the Constitution till we can get rid of it without destroying the last hope of free government in the world. What in the heck? How do you interpret that? He was terrified. Basically, what he's saying is I don't dare touch it, you know, because the whole thing is every president who served in office till Abraham Lincoln did not want to touch slavery. It was this it was the dynamite. Once again, let's just use it that way, because I think that works as an analogy. And eventually it did go off. But the thing is that every time they did everything in their power to keep the South from exploding from the South. That's why the compromise of 1850 with the Fugitive Slave Act. I mean, it was it was dreadful what it said, but it was the only way to put a Band-Aid on a situation. Because that's what the Compromise of 1850 is. It's a massive Band-Aid to solve an issue for a little while. And that, Jack, is anathema to the essence of leadership. When you think about those presidents who simply yeah. kicked the can down the road on the slavery question. Well, Millard Fillmore definitely did. And he, of course, he makes it into the list of, of the 10 worst presidents. You would, you would concur with that, right? I would agree, yeah. 
Move yeah, yeah. let me here. throw a couple of more things about Millard Fillmore. It's very interesting. Uh, when he was a congressman, he tried to ban the Bible from court cases for people to swear on. He didn't, he <laughs> tried to separate, he didn't want anything to do with religion and government. And when he was in Europe, he got an audience with the Pope. <laughs> and he was very upset that he would have to kiss the Pope's ring. And the Pope realized that it was an uncomfortable situation, so they just avoided it. But it was just kind of an interesting thing. He worked very, very hard to try to keep any kind of a Bible or anything else out of any kind of courtroom. So he was, a, of course, you know, an absolute separation of church and state. And he was defeated in that attempt. Something to mention. Well, Millard Fillmore, at least his wife, um, opened up a very nice library in the White House during his tenure. Yes, indeed. I mean, that's very important. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Martin Van Buren, uh, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore. Now let's head up to about 1853. You get this Democrat, Franklin Pierce, Democrat from New Hampshire. And what I most remember about mm -hmm. him is they had uh, a, a three kids. Two of them died from diseases, which were not uncommon that time um, period. And they are traveling down a few weeks before from New Hampshire down to Washington for the inaugural. He's just elected the 14th president of the United States. His wife uh, detested politics. She did not want her husband involved in politics, but he twisted her arm. And on the train trip down, Jack, the train derails and their son is not only killed, but he's mutilated, perhaps partially decapitated. It's, a, it's an unfortunate story. I mean, Franklin Pierce suffers from not only depression, but alcoholism. No doubt. His wife suffered from severe depression. Yep. Always did. And of course, this accident just pushes her over there. I mean, when we talk about depressed first ladies, she makes Mary Lincoln look like a cheerleader. Okay, I'm trying to find a... <laughs> you know, I mean, she was... She refused to even come down. She didn't want anything to do with the affairs of state. Um, and Franklin Pierce is another one of these individuals that tries to compromise. He tries to make everybody happy. And by doing so, makes nobody happy, which is the, the old story. The thing also with, with Franklin Pierce is that um, he was considered one of our better looking presidents. We had these two back to back, Fillmore and, and Pierce, our GQ presidents. And um, he uh, had some very, very interesting ideas. He wanted to bring Cuba into the United States. He was working very hard to create Cuba as a state. Wow. Couldn't make it happen. You also have in his administration, the beginnings of a real big problem called the Kansas and Nebraska Act. Yes. And also at the same time, you have Stephen Douglas pushing for something called popular sovereignty. And everything starts exploding. I mean, in a sense, you could look at bleeding Kansas as the pilot plant for the Civil War, because basically that's what it was. Wow. It was a battle with two different ideologies, two different constitutions. <laughs> you know, think about this. And one was pro-slavery, one was anti-slavery. And then they just started killing each other. This is where John Brown starts his whole rampage, killing uh, slave owners. It's just depressing, sad, no matter what he does, he's not happy. And they don't even renominate him. And he left with the following statement. He said, I guess there's nothing left to do but go home and get drunk. You know, and, and, and it's kind of sad. And that's what he does. He goes home, his wife dies. And uh, he basically drinks himself to death. Most people forget that uh, Franklin Pierce's secretary of state was a fellow named Jefferson Davis. Yeah. That was an interesting cabinet. 
Yeah, he was also, interestingly enough, in our conversation, he was uh, Zachary Taylor's son-in-law for a while. The thing about Franklin Pierce is this. He was qualified by the following statement, and he never could escape it. They talked about his military career, and they said he was the victor of many a hard-fought bottle. (laughs) And that image was something that he could never shake. And uh, I I just can't think of anything positive about his administration and his life. I mean, it's a very sad, sad life. And uh, as I said, he drank himself to death. The the only thing I can think of as positive is as the Kansas-Nebraska Act did lead to the forming of the Republican Party. Yeah, it did. And also the statute of Andrew Jackson that sits uh, in front of uh, uh, the White House there um, Mm -hmm. in Lafayette Square was put up uh, by Franklin Pierce during his administration. Oh, there's a positive. Okay. Okay. Right. (laughs) Yeah, it just depends. Finally, let's talk about Benjamin Harrison. He's the Republican here. He comes in and defeats uh, Grover Cleveland in a very contested election where Cleveland gets the popular vote, but Benjamin Harrison squeaks in with the electoral vote. And Mm -hmm. Benjamin Harrison is this Republican. He's from the great state of Ohio, but he kind of falls in the cracks of forgotten presidents also. Yes, he was known as the human iceberg. (laughs) That's how people described him. He, He was devoid of much personality. He didn't like small talk, although he was a very good speaker. If you just said, come up and speak, and he'd just go and talk. He's a very smart man, but he just didn't have a human touch. And it was a very difficult thing for him. And and after one term, he was voted out. What's Uh, surprising about what you just said is politics was the family business in the Harrison family. You've got four generations. Like I'm a pilot. I come from a family of aviators. He comes from four generations. His great grandfather was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, a founding father. His grandfather is the ninth president of the United States, William Henry Mm -hmm. Harrison. His dad served in Congress. What was his problem? Well, I don't know. (laughs) I'm not sure. But here's the interesting thing. There is a very sad, dark story. Now that you mentioned the the generations, his father, his father's body was stolen for medical research. Interesting. It was interesting. Yeah. And he had to get his father's body back. It's kind of a fascinating thing that happened. But Benjamin Harrison was just, he just didn't have that, that warm, fun touch. And uh, not a big man, but a little rotund and with uh, a beard. And he would just do his platitudes and speak. And that would be about it. But what he did that's so very important, being a veteran of the American Civil War, he pushed for the Pension Act for veterans, for wounded veterans and disabled veterans, so they would get a, week, a monthly check from the government for their service. And there were millions of veterans uh, who had to be taken care of. And it did a phenomenal job in wiping out the coffers of the, uh, of the country at the time. And so that was one of the things that they were arguing about. Another thing was the Sherman Antitrust Act came out during his term. And one real problematic thing was the McKinley Tariff. Yes. Congressman and, Wynn McKinley from Ohio. Yeah. That was one of the whoops things that McKinley did. It was, it was an extremely high tariff. And it was, it was wiped out as quickly as possible. But uh, it, it had an effect on his administration, of course. And uh, also, once again, his personality. One of the things that's overlooked, I think, is Benjamin Harrison was a considered at that time a first rate lawyer. He actually yes. wrote two books on constitutional law and mm-hmm. he presided as president during Plessy versus Ferguson. He made in a single term four Supreme Court appointments. Yes, he did. Yes. And he's a brilliant guy, as I was saying. He's a very smart man, but he just doesn't know how to talk to people. But another thing about Benjamin Harrison is that he is the earliest president 
that we have a sound recording of. And that's your specialty. Yeah. But uh, he made a recording around 1899, 1900 uh, for the Bettini Company. And that recording exists. And it's the earliest sound of a president. Jack, what does he sound like? Kind of a higher pitched voice. Okay. Um, not a very powerful voice but there again it's very hard to tell with that type of recording and that's it that that's the thing he was the human iceberg and uh i mean a nice man um, a devoted uh family man his wife died in office he remarried he also had a child after his presidency and he used to dress up as santa claus during christmas at the white house yeah. he yeah. looked the part i mean look at this guy yeah <laughs> But uh, interesting people. But the one thing that you notice in this whole gang of the five people we've talked about is that none of them seem to have that kind of personality that, that brings them over the edge, as it were. But none of them are the aggressive type. And of course, the aggressive type gets the attention. Teddy you know? Yeah. yeah. Theodore Roosevelt, you could not walk into a room and try to breathe air if Teddy Roosevelt was in there because he sucked it all out of the room. <laughs> you know, Benjamin Harrison would be in the room and he would, the room would dominate him. <laughs> it's a totally different thing. And it's a fascinating thing with these people that while they were all honorable people, they just didn't have that ability to, if you might say, like in a theatrical sense, you know, reach the audience beyond the stage lights. Here's a post-presidential quote from Benjamin Harrison. There's never been an hour since I left the White House that I have felt a wish to return to it. <laughs> hey, Jack, this has been a great discussion. I have a book uh, that I would like to uh, plug here uh, by Michael Gearhart, The Forgotten Presidents. Don't know if it's oh. in your library, but it's one of the no, it is. best uh, books in my library on these forgotten presidents. And it features the, the five that we just talked about. And I would recommend it for those historians out there that want to learn more about these forgotten presidents. Well, it's an amazing group of people and a, an unfortunate group of people in some respects. If you think about it. Um, but uh, they did their best. They served their country. And we should respect and honor them as much as we do those that we remember. Absolutely. Well said, my friend. Historian Jack Stanley of Chicago, thanks for being with us again today on Lumley Live. Thank you so much for having me. You've been watching Lumley Live, history and politics, conversations that make you think, listen, and learn. Lumley Live is a production of POTUS America, made in the USA.